Welcome everyone to Half History World Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and this is part six of my series on Winfield Scott Hancock. When we last saw him, he was waiting to be transported from the peninsula back to Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. Hancock and his men remained at Fort Monroe until transports could be sent them to aid General Pope's Army of Virginia. But by the time that the corps in which Hancock was in made it to Northern Virginia, a series of miscommunication and lack of cooperation made him miss the Battle of Second Manassas. However, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was now moving into Maryland, and the Union Army, again under George McClellan, would pursue the invading rebels. The Sixth Corps commander, William B. Franklin, could be just as slow as McClellan at attacking the enemy. Therefore, although an opportunity to strike at the rebels after crossing Crampton's Gap was clear, the Corps commander refused to commit any of his brigades, including Hancock's. The two armies collided at a little town called Sharpsburg on the Antietam Creek that fed into the Potomac River, and Hancock sat relatively unused during the entire battle, that is, until fate thrust him into a new position. General Israel B. Richardson and his division of the 2nd Corps had launched numerous assaults against the Bloody Lane. While he was doing this, a shell fragment from an artillery barrage hit him and he had to be carried from the field. He would die two months later from complications from the wounding, including infection. McClellan, knowing the capability of Hancock, ordered him to take command of Richardson's division. It took him a while to place his brigade under its new successor and make it to the location of Richardson's division. But when he arrived, McClellan ordered him to dig in and repel any attack made against his line. The division withstood a withering barrage of artillery while they waited for a possible attack. But other than a small Confederate contingent making an appearance on his left, but was driven away by artillery, Hancock and his new command waited through the night and into the next day, and ordered not to engage in hostilities. Lee's army retreated from the outskirts of Sharpsburg, and McClellan stayed put. A month later, he ordered Hancock and his division to cross the Potomac River at Harper's Ferry and reconnoiter the ground. Winfield pressed as far as Charlestown, drove away its light rebel defenders, and occupied the city. McClellan journeyed to the town in person to talk with Hancock, and after the discussion, became satisfied that no Confederate attack would be forthcoming, and pulled back the division. On November 5, 1862, Lincoln removed McClellan as commander of the Army of the Potomac and replaced him with Ambrose Burnside. Hancock was good friends with McClellan. It had been Little Mac who had gotten him an infantry command and installed him as a division commander. But he also saw the missed opportunity in letting Lee's army return across the Potomac and to sit idle on September 18th. He made the comment to those grumbling in the army, We are serving no one man. We are serving our country. Now at the head of a division, Hancock performed his duties masterfully as always. An aide in great detail described the 38-year-old officer. He was tall, with straight hair, now light brown, a mustache and a tuft on his chin of the same color, well-cut features, a firm jaw, and deep blue eyes. He was always neatly dressed, and one of the wonders of the Army of the Potomac was the fact that Hancock always wore a clean white shirt, well-pressed, even in the midst of a long march or a protracted battle. His years in the quartermaster department prepared him for the mountains of paperwork and correspondence necessary to be a division commander, and he was meticulous toward proper procedure. Even the smallest detail came under scrutiny of Hancock toward his subordinates, but as they said, he would never inflate the small details at the expense of larger ones. Hancock always wanted to know what was going on within his division, and in this respect we see why his men loved him so much. He took the time and care to know the names of his subordinates. He met with them as often as he could, getting to know them and their demeanor. These actions would pay dividends for the division commander when large battles erupted and he was expected to order certain brigades and regiments into a fight. He needed to know who was the best commander for certain situations. Hancock always played the long game when it came to his actions and behavior. One thing he liked to do was to woo newspaper reporters. He loved having them in camp. This action can be seen as twofold. One, he wanted him and his command to be portrayed in the best light when northern newspapers were constantly criticizing the Army of the Potomac. And two, having prominent leaders and commands featured in stories could boost the morale of not only the Army, but the nation. At one point later in the war, a newspaper writer did his command injustice with a story, and he even called for the arrest of the reporter. However, he even made reporters members of his staff 
or gave them positions within his command if they seemed to possess the qualities that he deemed necessary for achieving victory, and he was correct in his estimations. The men he gave those commissions to performed admirably in battle and contributed positively to the Union war effort. Soon after the Battle of Antietam, Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation. Hancock's political beliefs did not like the idea of the federal government interfering in the domestic institutions of the South, but again, when he looked around, secession and the Confederacy had called into question the Constitution itself. He understood that this would not be a short war and that extra constitutional means may be involved to suppress the rebellion. He did not like it, but he was willing to do what it took to preserve the Union. General Burnside marched his army to the Rappahannock River, across from the town of Fredericksburg. There he waited for pontoon bridges to arrive in order to cross. It looked as though Burnside had outmaneuvered Robert E. Lee. Beyond the town lay a series of heights known as Mary's Heights, and before pontoon bridges could make it to Burnside, Lee began occupying those areas and digging in where necessary. The Union Army commander was still determined to attack Lee there. Edwin Sumner, prior to the fighting, called together all of his division and brigade commanders, which included Hancock. Sumner vouched for Burnside and attempted to describe how the attack could work out in the Union's favor. Darius Couch and Winfield Hancock spoke up at this meeting and described how disastrous the attacks could be. Later, Burnside heard about this meeting and called together the same group of men, where he singled out Hancock. The division commander reinforced his belief that attacking the well-entrenched enemy would not end well for the federal forces. Burnside stated that the plan would work, and all he asked was for the loyal obedience to his orders. November 29, 1862, Hancock became a Major General of Volunteers. The very next day, he acquired the rank of Major in the Quartermaster Corps. Although the Major's rank meant little at the time, when the war was over and the wartime armies diminished, that rank would help his standing in the post-war army. It was Hancock's men who would help support the engineers assembling the pontoons across the river. The 66th and 57th New York regiments attempted to support the engineers from the riverbank, but ended up crossing the river to rid the opposite side of Confederate sharpshooters wreaking havoc on the poor engineers. The two regiments lost 150 men killed and wounded before the pontoon bridge was completed on December 11th. Once across, Hancock's division was the second division to attack the entrenched Confederates under General James Longstreet on the rebel left flank. French's division went in first, then behind them was Hancock. Winfield sent Zook's brigade first, then the Irish brigade, then finally Caldwell's men, but none of them could budge the Confederate line. The blue troops had to cross a canal, then weather the withering artillery fire across hundreds of yards in open terrain. Then within rifle fire, the Confederate infantry let loose volley after volley. By the end of the day, of around 5,000 men that Hancock sent into battle, 2,000 were casualties. Over the next day or so, the division recrossed the river, defeated. Years after the war, a Confederate infantryman who had defended Mary's Heights against Hancock heard someone proclaim that Pickett's men during Pickett's charge was the most heroic charge ever made. The old veteran replied by saying, I was with Lee's army from the beginning and surrendered at Appomattox and I never saw anything that surpassed the charge made by Hancock and Humphreys at Fredericksburg.